Hello, hello and welcome everybody um, to this, this webinar this evening. Um, I'm getting a little bit distracted by the waiting room, but I'm just going to turn that off and leave that to my handy assistant who is going to let people in as you come. It's wonderful to see you all here this evening. Um, I want to, to welcome you um, to this event that's run by the um, Centre for Theology and Public Issues and the Theology Programme at the University of Otago. Um, my name is Lynn Taylor. Um, I am the lecturer in pastoral theology at the University of Otago. And together with David Toombs from CTPI, we welcome you to the Zoom gathering this evening. I want to say hi my welcome. Um, Anyohasio, malolele, talofa, warm Pacific greetings. Um, hello to you all. Thank you for, for being with us um, and for coming and engaging in this important topic. For me, I'm interested in this topic because I want to see people and churches flourish. Um, and these are difficult times. They're certainly the most difficult times that have occurred in my lifetime. And I'm always interested in how we can be the church and how we can be Christians, um, how we can live into our faith and our, our life as the church, um, whatever situation we find ourselves in. And so for me, um, that was part of my motivation um, to enthusiastically support David's idea of having this <laughs> um, and to, um, to um, um, invite this excellent team of panelists to explore how we can um, balance safety and inclusion, how we can be the church um, and be Christians in this traffic light season. So, um, um, and as we begin, I want to acknowledge and honor God and to pray that God's um, love, hope, joy, and peace will be with us this evening and at all times. I'm going to hand over to David Toombs, who is going to um, just talk through the format of this evening um, and also um, introduce himself. So thanks, David. Thanks, Lynn and Kiara Koto. Wonderful to see you all uh, on the screen in front of me. Thanks ever so much for joining us. So I'll start with a brief line out of the um, hour and 15 minutes or so ahead of us this evening. In a moment, Lynn and I will start by introducing our four panelists. Then we'll begin the panel discussion itself, and uh, this part of the evening is being recorded. So in this first part of the evening, half an hour or so, a little bit more perhaps, if you have questions, please make a note of them as we go along. You won't be able to post them in the chat just yet, but if you just make a mental or physical note of them, we'll move to the second part of the evening where we move into plenary Q&A. And at that point, we'll ask you to post your questions into the chat, and then Lynn and I will facilitate the questioning process, uh, bringing your questions into conversation with our panelists. Uh, please bear in mind that questions are definitely best uh, rather than uh, comments, sermons or other literary forms. Uh, at the end of the evening, there'll be final thoughts from each of the panellists and we expect to wrap up at about 8.15. So that's what's ahead of us. Uh, let's move straight into introductions. Please to uh, introduce each of the panellists and after we've uh, mentioned them, panellists, perhaps if you'll just say hi or give a wave so we can see where you are on the screen before we go on to introduce the next panellist. Uh, so our first panellist is the Reverend Deborah Broom, who's Ministry Educator in the Anglican Diocese of Wyapa. And prior to that, she was in parish ministry for 18 years. It's great to have you with us, Deborah. It's great to be here, David. Thank you. Our second panellist is Gareth Jones, who is Emeritus Professor of Anatomy here at the University of Otago. Gareth has an interest in bioethics, and when he says an interest, uh, he means that he has an interest in and knows lots of stuff about bioethics. I um, mean, he's written extensively about COVID-19 from a Christian perspective. Thanks for being here, Gareth. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Our third panellist is Joe Kierman. Um, Joe is an infectious disease immunologist and associate professor um, here in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Otago. Joe has held advisory roles and participated in public outreach about COVID-19 vaccines. Joe, it's really great to have you with us this evening. Yeah, Dakota, it's great to be here. Thank you. 
And our final panelist is um, Professor Paul Trabilko, who's Professor of New Testament Studies here in the Theology Program at the University of Otago. Thank you, Paul, for your involvement this evening. Uh, kia ora koutou. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks, Lynn. Oh, thank you. Joe. we're going to start with you. Um, you're an immunologist, um, and so you're uniquely qualified to help us to understand something about the science behind the vaccines and New Zealand's public health response. What should we know? Well, I've been thinking about how to describe our current situation, and I thought actually I could liken it to um, these programs that you see on TV when people are trying to buy a house and they give the real estate agent their wish list of things that they want with their house. So it might be two bathrooms and a double garage and a great big backyard. And then the real estate agent has to give them a bit of a reality check depending on their um, the, the amount of money that they've got to spend. And inevitably they have to compromise. And I feel like this is a little bit of the situation that we're in at the moment. So we've been in this really kind of luxurious situation um, with our worship in New Zealand. So we've had a lot of um, freedom where we've been able to turn up and, um, and mix and be with who we want to be with. And now we've got COVID-19 and we're at this point where I guess if you think about um, someone who might have moved from sold a house in Dunedin and has their money and then they've moved to Auckland and realised that their money is not going to go that far and they have to reach a compromise and perhaps they have to move a bit further out of town or have a, have a smaller house. And so I've, I've been thinking of it in that way that it's really a situation of compromise for us. And to delve into the science, the virus itself that causes COVID-19 is really, really tiny, so we can't see it. Um, you could fit 100 million of them on a pinhead, so they're very, very small. But even though we can't see the virus, we know that it causes illness in some people, and in some people that illness is severe enough that they require hospitalisation. And in a small number of people, it's severe enough that they require ICU care and they could die. So we know that about the virus. Um, we've got a vaccine, and that vaccine might seem like relatively new, well, it is new technology to most of us because um, it's a type of vaccine that we haven't seen before. But in fact, scientists have been working on this for many, many years. And um, basically what the vaccine is, is it's a bit of nucleic acid. Um, it's very, it's messenger nucleic acid, which is really fragile. And so it gets bro broken down very quickly, which is why we have to transport it at minus 80. Um, and it's wrapped up in a bit of lipid or fat. And it's just wrapped up in that fat to keep it stable. So it really helps preserve it and, and keep it working. So the vaccine has been shown to be very good at um, keeping people out of um, hospital and out of ICU. So even though they might get sick, they don't get so sick that they um, are really in that high risk category. Um, and that's really important to us because of our healthcare system getting overwhelmed at this time um, if there's too many people getting sick all at once. The vaccines aren't risk-free, so we've all heard of um, side effects that can be caused by them, and some of us have experienced. I know I got a bit of a flu-like um, symptoms after I had the vaccine. But when that's all said and done, they're very safe and infinitely more preferable um, than having severe COVID-19. So what we need to understand about the vaccine is while well, it stops us getting incredibly sick and it can reduce transmission of the virus, which means it can stop me, it can't stop me, it can reduce the risk of me spreading the virus to other people. Um, it doesn't actually 100% stop transmission. And I think it's really important to understand that even though you've been vaccinated, you can still transmit uh, the virus if you get it. So um, uh, that's an important feature. And I guess people have heard now of um, Omicron, which is our new um, variant of co uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. It does seem, although we're looking, um, and scientists have been looking at how effective the vaccine is going to be against this variant, it does look like it's going to be a little bit less effective um, than it has been against Delta. So um, what can we do as well as getting uh, vaccinated? It's really clear that this virus is spread through aerosol. So there's some public health measures that we can take that will help us uh, reduce our risk of getting infected. Um, 
And those are things like physical distancing, so we don't stand particularly close to one another, so we're not inhaling someone else's exhalations. Um, having really good ventilation in a room, so having, this is awful in Dunedin in winter, I can't imagine it, but having lots of windows open or being outdoors. Um, definitely by staying home if you're unwell, and also by mask wearing. And there's some really neat data that's come out of the uh, US recently um, showing that if someone is infected and they meet with another person, if they're both wearing masks, it really does reduce transmission events um, a lot. Whereas if one or the other isn't wearing a mask or neither of them are wearing a mask, then that transmission um, risk increases. And then I think a, a final point that I'd make um, from my perspective as an infectious diseases um, immunologist is with all the infections that I've been working with um, over the years, they all um, have a bit of a threshold in terms of the amount of virus that you're exposed to and the degree of severity of the infection. So at some point um, when you have a lot of um, exposure or a, a high infection, um, then you have very, very severe disease or death that accompanies that. And while that relationship hasn't been shown particularly well for this particular virus, it's been true for every other infection that I've ever looked at. So I think it would likely hold true. And so all of those measures that we can take to reduce transmission will also reduce infectious load that we're exposed to as individuals as well. And I just think um, in general, learning to live with COVID-19 is a really different mindset from trying to eliminate COVID-19. Um, the public health measures that we've got in place under the traffic light system are designed to um, make it, um, make our ability to kind of go about our lives as normal as possible. Um, but reducing the risk to um, the population so that we don't have overwhelming levels of infection. So it's trying to reduce the kind of super spreader events. So introducing public health measures so that you're not having large numbers of unvaccinated people who are unmasked, all nice and close together in a room for extended periods of time. So it's, it's about reducing that risk so you don't overwhelm the healthcare system. So um, if I just summarize, I'll say vaccines are good. Um, but we do need public health measures to accompany those and to mitigate spread. And it involves everyone working together and being willing to compromise um, in order for us to be able to go ahead and worship in groups as, as we would like to. Thanks, Joe. That's such a helpful explanation um, and such a helpful analogy in terms of you know that idea of compromise and you know compared with house buying. Um, because we'd all like it just to go away, wouldn't we? We'd just all like there to be a solution that just made it all stop. Um, and that's not happening and it's not happening anytime soon. And so we do need to work with these public health measure, measures um, and we do need to continue to compromise so that we can get um, to, to that point of um, one day <laughs> being back to, to some sort of new normal. Thanks, Joe. I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about your own experience? I understand that you've been um, not participating in church yourself for a while. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I, I think my own experience is particularly unique. Um, I'm director of the largest program at the University of Otago, so that's the Health Sciences First Year Program. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I get exposed to a lot of um, people. I th I'd say that my exposure is quite high. Um, and also I've spent almost 30 years uh, looking at infectious diseases and understanding transmission and high risk associated with um, situations and conditions. So I'm very highly attuned to this. And unfortunately, it's a, perhaps a bit of a, a curse for me that I see that um, those potential situations wherever I go. And because of my high exposure risk and, um, and the fact that um, the church congregation is uh, does tend to be of people who are of an older age and age unfortunately is one of the highest risk factors for severe COVID-19. Um, I've really avoided going to church because I don't want to be responsible for someone else getting really sick. Um, so I've tried to do what I can so I attend my house group which is a much smaller group um, but um, I, my experience is I, I mean online services are uh, are good but they're definitely a poor cousin to being in person um, and 
I think the most important thing to understand is that everyone's got um, a different perspective or a different reason for the compromises that they're willing to take or that they're not willing to take. And it's really important to respect those because we're all walking in different paths and um, our experiences are different. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, passing to you, Gareth. Uh, first, uh, thanks so much for all the work you've done already in helping people to understand some of the ethics around responses to COVID. Uh, a question is, why is this issue so important for you? And what would you say in terms of why it should be important for all of us? Well, thank you, David. Well, I think in, in answering that sort of question, I have to say I feel very much like an interloper because I go from one discipline to another to another and I don't claim to be an expert at all these particular disciplines. But I think it comes down to two years ago, I would never ever have dreamt that I would have been writing about vaccines. Reasons, very simple. I'm not like Joe, I'm not an immunologist. Um, if you want to uh, pigeonhole me, I'm a neuroscientist, but that's pretty irrelevant probably as far as this discussion is concerned. The thing was, though, from my angle, as soon as the pandemic hit in early 2020, I realized that enormous issues were being raised at the science-faith interface. As we all know, people were asking, well, where's God in all this? And how should Christians respond? And some very fanciful ideas were being tossed about. So rather than try and find some esoteric reasons, it immediately struck me we should be looking to science for answers. That's not going to give us all the answers, but it will give us many of the answers. And this is because, from a Christian angle, science is a gift from God, and it's to be used to the benefit of his creation, both humans and the environment. And I think it's, this has applied over the two years so far of the pandemic. As we know, the first year was lockdown, and that was the province of public health specialists and epidemiologists. And that, as very simply, was because nothing else was available, although there were plenty of people working behind the scenes to try and get vaccines off the ground. But then when you came to the second year, that is this year, uh, it's been the year very obviously of vaccines, and it's been the province of immunologists, pharmaceutical companies, etc. Now, I think in many ways, as you look back, you see that the lockdown was fairly uncontroversial. This was the 2020 lockdown when it really affected everyone. And it was fairly uncontroversial because it was entirely the decision of government. By contrast, though, the use of vaccines is very controversial because it depends upon my decision whether I want to be vaccinated. In other words, personal decision making is now central. Okay, one thing, of course, as soon as we touch on vaccines, we talk about vaccine mandates. And of course, the whole purpose of any vaccine mandate is to protect the health of society, the health of individuals, health of the community, health of everyone. <clears throat> but of course, they do this by impinging upon the perceived rights and freedom of individuals. And that's when the trouble begins particularly because we live in intensely individualistic societies. And so it affects all of us, um, whatever we think about the matter. And so I think a challenge for those of us who have been vaccinated um, and who think that vaccination is the best way forward, uh, we've got to ask, well, how do we treat the unvaccinated fairly? And this, I think, is where mandates get into difficulty if they seem to restrict normal existence too much. Now, of course, you might say, what is normal existence? And that could have, we could have quite a bit of debate about that. Um, but you can see that this quickly leads to people who are unvaccinated, thinking that they are being isolated socially, and they have the feeling that they are social outcasts. Now, I'm not going into you know, whether or not what their position is justified, but there's no doubt many of them feel like social outcasts. And this, of course, hits the church as hard as any other parts of society. 
Now, it seems to me that you'd expect Christians to have no trouble in the debate on vaccines because a basic tenet of the Christian faith is to love others and especially our neighbors, our community, etc. And also, of course, very much to protect the vulnerable. Unfortunately, though, some Christians are very suspicious of science and scientists, and they don't see science as the hand of God protecting the health and welfare of his creation. Now, that, of course, is my position. And so, obviously, I want to get people to appreciate the value of scientific approaches to something as destructive as this pandemic. And for me, this is the heart of the Christian response. Unfortunately, though, once people are suspicious of science, they are ready to follow pseudoscience. And that, as we know, is widely available on the internet. And they also then become perhaps very political in some ways, and they take up political stances, criticizing any government control. And you find the same whether it's in this country or any other country. Much of the um, criticism, concern is about government control. Now for Christians, I think all this opens up a host of ideas that appear to back up theological beliefs about the end times, certainly in the way in which some Christians look at these things. So very simply then, I see the central importance of science, and that is because it represents a major plank by which God helps humankind. And so I don't see it as an either or science or Christianity. I see it as very much central to, in this case, the Christian response. I think it's enough for me for the moment. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Gareth. And that, that would be the um, way that Christian scientists across the world would see their, their work, wouldn't it? That they, um, it's very much an expression um, of their Christian faith as well. For me, when I look at the Bible, I see things like the need to, to love others and to protect the vulnerable, um, as, as Gareth mentioned. But um, there are these fanciful ideas that come out, um, and sometimes people point to scriptures in relation to them. So, Paul, I'd like to go to you and ask, um, what are we to make of it when people link the vaccine or New Zealand's COVID response traffic lights to the mark of the beast or to other apocalyptic ideas? What do we do with that? Yes, well, thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, so uh, a bit of background, I guess, in terms of how we uh, understand this. So Revelation uh, as a book was written to the first century readers, uh, hence the seven uh, actual letters uh, in Revelation 2 uh, to 3. Uh, and as God's word to those uh, original readers, most scholars uh, see Revelation as having a meaning for the late first century. So it does obviously have quite a lot of future dimensions. The New Jerusalem of Revelation uh, 21 is, is clearly future and a hope for us. But those readers were uh, living uh, under the Roman Empire. And uh, one of the things that the book speaks of is worshipping the beast, uh, Romans 13, 12. And that's generally taken to be a reference to worshipping the emperor. Uh, worship of the emperor was very prevalent in, in Western Asia Minor, where those readers lived. So the beast is, is the emperor. So this passage about Mark of the Beast is in Revelation 13, uh, which says no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a person. Its number is 666. So the mark of the beast uh, includes a number, and most commentators uh, take that number 666 to be a reference to the emperor Nero. If you take the Greek letters of his uh, name and uh, translate them, transliterate them into Hebrew, then Hebrew letters all have a numerical value. And if you add up the value, it comes to 666. So uh, that's, it's a code, in other words, for uh, the emperor. So the mark of the beast then is some sort of uh, bodily mark or something like that uh, to indicate uh, devotion to the emperor. Uh, and Revelation then is saying that worship of the emperor uh, via the mark of the beast is totally wrong and is uh, demonic. 
So that's the sort of meaning in the first uh, instance of what the mark of the beast means. Now, there might well uh, have been, I think, parallels or resonances uh, in later history with this idea of mark of the beast. But the key idea of the mark is that, or, and the beast, is the requirement to worship uh, some other god, uh, to um, uh, worship, in this case, uh, the emperor. So uh, if the, um, the state, if, in this case in New Zealand, was requiring us to worship some other god, some other deity or, or Satan, uh, then we could make a parallel with the mark of the beast. But it seems to you know, very clear that currently nobody in, in the country is saying we can't worship God, uh, that we can't uh, participate in, in worshipping uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so I don't think this uh, mark of the beast applies at all uh, in, in this place. The scripture simply doesn't apply. Thanks, Paul. So what how can we look to the bible for guidance today in terms of how we should live um, in this time of pandemic and this time of traffic lights yeah so there's um there's lots of things i think that apply and, and some have been spoken of already haven't they uh obviously we sh the we shouldn't obey the state if it calls us to worship other gods uh or if it was to ban christian faith for example but uh, uh, there's the general expectation that we would abide by uh, the law. Uh, in Romans 13, Paul, uh, 4, Paul says that the state can be seen as God's servant for your good uh, and, and encourages us to pay taxes, for example. And other passages uh, encourage us to obey the state. Again, always provided, I think, that the state is not um, you know, killing Christians or banning the worship of God. But as already mentioned, the concern uh, not for ourselves, but for others, uh, the love of uh, neighbor uh, is clearly a, a Christian command from the Bible. Another one I think that's really uh, of importance just at the moment is about uh, freedom. And so we have a lot of discussions mm -hmm. about, about freedom. I think in scripture, our, we don't have absolute freedom to uh, do as we please. Uh, Romans 6, for example, says that we're no longer slaves of sin through Christ's death on the cross, but now we've become slaves of, of righteousness, and we've become enslaved to God, to be obedient to God. So that calls us to do God's will, which involves loving God and loving neighbor. So in scripture, we're, we're not free in the sense of sort of autonomous beings who can uh, choose what we should do. Uh, we are uh, to use our freedom in Christ to, to serve others. And, and Galatians 5, for example, is very helpful uh, there. And, and Paul writes there, uh, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So certainly we've been freed from sin and death, but we use that uh, freedom uh, to, uh, to serve others. And the same in, in John's gospel, uh, where Jesus teaches that, you know, if the son will make you free, you will be free indeed. But that freedom is then um, uh, sort of focused on the new commandment that you love one another. Uh, John 13, uh, 34, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. So uh, scriptures are pretty clear that we don't have sort of absolute freedom, but our freedom is freedom to serve others. Thanks, Paul. That's really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And let me uh, take it over to you now, Deborah. Um, we're all aware that the traffic light system affects all of us. It impacts on everybody. But we're particularly interested in the impact it has on church ministers and church leaders people who are dealing with the really difficult practical issues. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about the particular challenges that ministers are facing today and perhaps speak to their concerns and anxieties as they wrestle with these difficult issues? The issues are difficult. And one of the things that, that makes it so difficult is, is wanting to do two things, to keep people as safe as possible and to be as inclusive as possible. Church leaders have got a, a very clear pastoral responsibility to care for everybody. 
um, to care in this sense, both for those who are vaccinated and those who are non-vaccinated. But there is this particular care of those who are most vulnerable. And, and we can track that um, right down to you know, the, the, the attitude of Jesus in the gospels uh, to those who are particularly vulnerable, uh, to, to Paul's mention of, of caring for the vulnerable or the weak. So church leaders are very much wanting to, um, to extend to everybody the, the love of God. There is this whole thing of um, theologies around the body of Christ. What is it to be a member of the body of Christ? About how to extend to everybody the, the welcome, inclusive love of God. Uh, God, you know, Christ came into the world um, because God so loved the world. We're just coming up to to Christmas and that sense of here is, is God valuing humanity so much, wanting to come and share our, our precarious existence. So there's very much this, this impetus behind a lot of what we do about wanting to, to be welcome to all. Um, the communion table, for example, is open to all those who are baptized. Baptism is open to those who, who open their hearts to God's love uh, in Christ. So that's been a, a pretty kind of, you know, deep thing that churches are really keen on. The thing is, how do we extend that welcome to all at the same time as caring for everybody? So one of the issues that churches have had to grasp is um, requiring forms of identification, requiring people to show their, their vaccine pass in order to attend uh, a gathering for worship or a church event. Um, for some people that, that really does make things difficult because they don't want to make a distinction. On the other hand, there is that key impetus on wanting to keep people as safe as possible by you know, a way of loving our neighbors by not creating conditions which um, as far as possible don't bring harm to those who, who worship with us or who are part of our communities in other ways. Um, most of us are acutely aware that a number of church gatherings have turned out to be super spreader events. And, and nobody wants to go through something like that. Um, there's also the ethical obligation on churches to consider the welfare of, of people who work within them, whether that's um, church staff, stipended clergy, um, volunteers, organists, people who who help make a worship service happen. And, and how do we care for people like that? Are we asking them to come into a situation where they're putting themselves at risk? So it's very much a weighing up of, of safety and inclusivity. But the key thing that, that kind of underpins the conclusion that, that most churches have, have done is it's not pos possible to be perfectly safe and perfectly inclusive at the same time. If you run a service where vaccine passes are not checked, you know, an all-comers service, that sounds really inclusive, but as soon as you do that, you'll have another group of people say, but we don't feel included because we don't feel safe. Um, it's interesting that, that one of our um, our Anglican Social Services up here uh, is a day centre for the elderly. And attendance at that actually increased markedly once the people who were coming along knew that you had to be vaccinated to get there. They felt safe, therefore they felt more included, therefore they were more willing to come. So it's, it's weighing up those things about how do we extend God's love to everybody but at the same time, keep as many as possible safe. So that then leads into another challenge, doesn't it? How do we, how do we provide worship? How do we include people who aren't vaccinated? Um, some of those options include online worship or to run a, a smaller separate service for those who aren't vaccinated. Um, I am aware that some of my colleagues themselves are immunocompromised and have non-vaccinated people amongst their parishioners. What's going to happen if someone who's non-vaccinated gets really sick, either of COVID or something else, and the person 
whose calling it is to care for them is going, but if I go there, I'm likely to get really sick. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for the other people that I'm also caring for? So it's it's really difficult issues for clergy to, um, to deal with in particular, because our first impetus is to care for people, to, to extend God's love for everybody. But it's really hard to do that to everybody, because as soon as you say yes to some people, it, it turns out that you're inevitably going to be saying no to other people. Um, there was also a, a slightly different range of issues about the level at which a decision is taken. Uh, should that be taken at, at a national level? Should that be taken at the level of individual parishes? Um, uh, I'm an Anglican and, and what we've decided is that there was a common decision amongst um, all the bishops to require vaccine passes, but the, the decision was formally taken by the Bishop and Standing Committee in each individual diocese. That's the way we organize things. Um, I know other denominations have opted for a decision to be taken more locally, and, and that can be problematic. So there's a, a question of if your decision has been taken at the level of an individual congregation, and those are the people that you know, are they then going to feel more hurt, more excluded, because the decision is being taken closer to them? So there's a range of issues like that as well. Mm. Thanks, Deborah. You, you've given a really helpful insight into how difficult these issues are, are for clergy. And, and what's come to my mind listening to you uh, is for those of us who are not clergy, those of us who are, are church members, what can we be doing that's helpful and supportive of clergy and church leaders and ministers, particularly at this Christmas time, which is, of course, uh, quite a busy and challenging time for, for clergy anyway? What, what sort of practical support can be offered that would be most useful? Well, I'm tempted to say that the obvious practical thing is to get vaccinated, uh, if not for yourself, then for, for other members of your community, and, and to carry your vaccine pass, to wear your mask, to do all of those things, because the more people who do that, the easier it's going to be to, to care for the people who don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, and, and for everyone to, to help members of their community. Um, for example, there may be people who um, can't do online worship, they haven't got the devices or the tech savvy. Um, and so I know during the first lockdown, there were people who were you know, helping out um, the elderly community members, some of whom were about the same age as them, um, to participate in online worship. I guess one of the other things that's really helpful um, at this time of year, um, to realise that this year, in fact, these last two years um, have been hard. Church leaders have had to um, develop a whole lot of new skills, whether that's um, clergy or lay leaders. Um, who would have thought we'd all find ourselves leading online services and you know, doing Zoom, preparing pre-recorded? Um, so to recognise that people are tired and to encourage them where they can to take their holidays. Uh, it's one thing we've been trying to do amongst you know, our colleagues. Um, we're all tired and we need a break. So to take, you know, to, to make sure that message gets along as well, because um, you know, clergy are kind of, I don't know if you know what it's like, but people die between Christmas and New Year, just like they do at other times of the year. So there is this always this impetus to, to keep on working, to keep on caring. Thanks, Deborah. That, that's really helpful advice for us. Thanks ever so much for, for bringing your expertise to it. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring this panel process to an end by just revisiting each of the panellists with, with a particular uh, question that, that we'll ask them, and then we'll move into more general Q&A. So uh, let's revisit uh, the, um, the panellists. Joe, can I ask you, um, what key idea would you like us and those present this evening to take from tonight's panel? I think, um, I guess what I had said earlier was, you know, vaccines are fantastic. And if you can, if you can get vaccinated, please do. We also need public health measures and we do need, um, and I'm just reiterating what, re reiterating what has just been said really, 
um, we do need as many people as possible to to try and um, take those up. So that's wearing masks, keeping home if you're not feeling well, um, trying to keep distance if you can, um, and thinking about things like ventilation. Um, so it's about working together. And it is sadly about compromise as well, which is tough for us, I think, to just readjust mm. um, what we're used to. Uh, thanks, Joe. G Gareth, let me ask you the same question. Well, I could give a few answers, some of which go way outside my areas of expertise. But, but one of the things that really hits me is that, um, you know, in 2020, everyone was desperate to develop a vaccine or, you know, a vaccine which was efficient and safe. And what happens? Quite spectacularly, this was done. But I don't know how many people would then have uh, actually predicted that there are many people who would reject the vaccine. And I'm not talking now about, you know, sorry, committed anti-vaxxers, but many other people as well would actually reject the vaccines which are actually available. And uh, to me, I think that was something which certainly I didn't predict, and I don't know how many people did predict, uh, but that has been a huge problem. Uh, and if I can just say just one other thing, um, you know, and this is going outside my area, but in the end, what is the church? Better give that to one of the theologians. But I mean, you know, we, we think so much when we're talking about mandates, etc., about the church, church service, formal church service on a Sunday morning type of thing. Well, but what is the church? I think we all know it's something much broader than that. And there are many other ways, I think, in which one can work with each other uh, as long as one can learn to live with one's disagreements, to learn and treat love and with grace. And much of this, though, can be done outside that Sunday morning setting. Thanks very much, Gareth. And you, you raised the question there, what is for church? And I, I think it was Deborah, but I, I might be mixing up our panelists, but somebody has certainly introduced us uh, to the theology of the church as the body of Christ, which I think is a really significant theological uh, area to, to explore. I don't know if that's one Paul is going to pick up or not, but let me take, uh, take the question to you, Paul. What's mm. one thing that you want us to take away from this evening? Uh Yes, you've uh, you read my mind, David. So uh, I have thought about the body of Christ as a really key uh, image for us uh, at this time. And, and the way the image is used, of course, is that every part of the body matters. And, you know, Paul has this idea, you know, the, the eye can't say to the hand because you're not an eye, you don't matter. But everyone has a distinctive role, has distinctive gifts. Uh, distinctive gifts of the spirit, but everybody everybody matters and everybody's part of the body with Christ as, uh, as head. Uh, and that means uh, that we need to think of, uh, of using sort of we language and, and us, so that we need to think of, of ourselves in, in, in the church uh, as belonging together. Uh, and that means that we uh, we think of uh, not just of myself, but of the impact of what I'm doing on others, of how this might contribute uh, to uh, their welfare. And that leads to all sorts of uh, biblical commands, you know, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice or serve one another. And that's because we're all interconnected as members of the body of Christ. So if this is, if getting vaccinated is something that's really helpful for other people, then that's what I should do if I, if I can. Uh, and if wearing a mask or behaving in certain ways is beneficial to others, that's the really key thing. And uh, I guess that um, leads into the sort of corollary. We've had lots of discussion, haven't we, or in, in the media about rights language. But of course, with rights comes responsibilities. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, what the body of Christ is about. We're, we're responsible for one another and to one another because we belong together. We're interconnected just as my hand belongs to, to me and just the way my eye does, you know. So that interconnectedness and responsibility and therefore for caring uh, for everyone uh, in the body. And I think we can extend that to those uh, outside the body of Christ too. People we, uh, we want to love and care for, they too are, are part of uh, our responsibility and those we want to care for. Mm, thanks, Paul. Mm. 
you. Uh, and to you, Deborah, what one thing you'd like us to take away, particularly? Only one. I, I, because I, I wanted to to echo the the point Paul has just made. Um, you know, we are our brothers and sisters keepers. Um, we do have a responsibility to care for one another. I guess the one point above all is is for people to understand that the decision that churches have taken to require vaccine passes is a decision based on love. It's about commitment to care for everyone and especially for the most vulnerable. Um, wanting to keep people safe is an expression of love. Um, inclusivity and, and welcome are hugely important, but the way we can welcome most people is to have them feel safe. And so it's about prioritizing care for the vulnerable, to, to, to have a vaccine, to require a vaccine pass, because it is a way of loving our neighbor, um, giving expression to the concept I often refer to as bigger than me. Um, this is about you know, doing it for the community, for the whanau. It's a decision based on love. Thank you, Deborah. That, that's a wonderful note to, to end. On. Thank you to all our panellists for this part uh, of the session. Uh, we'll uh, stop the recording at this point and transition into the plenary part of it. It takes uh, just a very short time for us to reset our security settings. So